Hi everyone and welcome to the second part of a three-part lecture on the foundations of qualitative research too. This part focuses on experiential and critical qualitative research. These materials are the result of a collaboration between Virginia or Ginny Brown on the left, myself, Victoria Clark in the middle and Nikki Hayfield on the right. The lectures are narrated either by me or Nikki, and as I'm speaking now, you can tell that I am narrating this lecture. To give you an overview of this session, this is the second of two lectures, each of which are divided into three parts, exploring the foundations of qualitative research, imaginatively titled Foundations of Qualitative Research 1 and Foundations of Qualitative Research 2. And in these sessions, we're exploring the values, characteristics and theoretical and philosophical foundations of qualitative research. The aim of this second lecture is to provide further grounding in qualitative research foundations, building on the material covered in Foundations 1, and in particular, introducing some of the concepts and terminology that define Big Q qualitative research. We consider some of the defining characteristics of Big Q qualitative research, and in particular, how qualitative research differs from quantitative research. This lecture also builds on the discussion of different orientations to qualitative research in the first lecture, by considering experiential and qualitative camps or paradigms, so sets of values for research. And finally, we'll explore the key concepts of subjectivity and reflexivity and, big scary word alert, the ontological and epistemological foundations of qualitative research, so how qualitative research addresses some key philosophical issues for doing research. Throughout the recording, there's opportunities for you to pause the recording and reflect on your knowledge and understanding of qualitative research. For a quick overview of the three parts of the lecture, in part one, we focused on the key characteristics of qualitative research. So if you haven't listened to that part, I recommend that you go back and do so now. In this part, we're going to focus on experiential and critical qualitative research. And then in the final part three, we are focus on key theoretical and philosophical concepts like subjectivity, reflexivity and the scariologies. And hopefully we'll demystify them a bit for you. So we're going to start with an invitation to pause for reflection. If you've listened to Foundations of Qualitative Research 1 and if you haven't, you might want to go back and do this now. Pause the recording and make a note of your understanding of an empathic orientation to meaning in qualitative research and a suspicious orientation to meaning in qualitative research. If you'd like to engage in this activity, please pause the recording now. So let's think about experiential and critical orientations to qualitative research or camps as we're calling them here, hence the image of a campground. In the Foundations of Qualitative Research 1, we discuss different orientations to meaning, both empathic or suspicious, different orientations to interpretation of meaning, and different views of language. And we discussed a distinction between a more reflective view of language and a more active or performative view of language. These different orientations to meaning and language broadly map onto what we're calling two qualitative research camps within a big Q paradigm experiential qualitative research and critical qualitative research. Now, the way we map out qualitative research here isn't something that every single qualitative researcher agrees on. We see there being two camps within a broader big Q paradigm. Others argue that there are different qualitative research paradigms, different values frameworks for conducting research. So a common mapping um, that Grant and Giddings discuss in a relatively accessible paper that I'd encourage you to read if you want to understand more about this. They talk about a positivist or post-positivist paradigm, an interpretive paradigm, a post-structuralist paradigm and a radical paradigm. And this is quite a common and influential way of mapping out different qualitative research paradigms. We can get really bogged down in a debate about whether there are two camps within one paradigm or whether there are multiple paradigms. And this is not a debate that I think we need to necessarily spend a lot of time with. You can, if you want to, do lots of reading around this. 
the really important message that we want you to take away is that qualitative research isn't homogenous, isn't singular, it's not one thing, it's not one approach to things. And we want you to be wary of descriptions of qualitative research that don't acknowledge the full range and diversity of qualitative research. So I mentioned in Foundations 1 that people often define qualitative research as focused on experience, but that misses out the whole critical qualitative camp. So it's important to be wary of these kind of limiting descriptions of the scope of qualitative research. They suggested in part one that meaning and meaning making is a better, more inclusive way of framing the kind of purpose or interest of qualitative research. If you do want to read more about the experiential and critical camps, we've suggested two references, Brown and Clark, our textbook, Successful Qualitative Research, and also a short commentary piece by Steve Reicher. Broadly speaking, experiential qualitative research is concerned with participants' sense making, the meanings, views, perspectives, experiences or practices that participants express in interviews or focus groups and other types of data. Their interpretations are prioritised and accepted and focused on rather than being used as a basis for analysing something else. So we're trying to understand the world from the perspective of participants. We're trying to give voice to their concerns. This experiential approach to research, this experiential camp, shouldn't be confused with untheorised or non-interpretive research that just summarises what participants said. Experiential research is often richly theorised, often highly interpretive. Within this framework, broadly speaking, researchers are envisaging a world waiting to be discovered and language gives a window onto this world, but not a sort of universal reality or universal world. There's an acknowledgement of multiple um, understandings, multiple truths, multiple realities that are contextually located. And that language is important and a, an approach that allows us to collect language, people's words, people's sense making is important because it enables us to focus on participants own framing around issues, their own terms of reference. By collecting qualitative data, we can find out things that we might never have imagined, things that might have been lost using quantitative methods. This means the scope of knowledge and understanding is opened up considerably when we use qualitative research. It allows a rich, full and multifaceted understanding of a phenomena of people's lives, not least because the complexity of people's meanings or experiences are revealed and retained in qualitative data. So let's consider an example of an experiential qualitative study to help give us a concrete sense of what this research looks like in practice and how we might spot it in the wild. When you're reading about qualitative research, when you're reading particular studies, how do you know to classify it as experiential or critical? What indications are you looking for? So this study focused on the meaning, importance and function of music in the lives of older people. And it is based on in-depth interviews with 52 older people, 24 women and 28 men, and they were aged between 60 and 98. And they had heterogeneous experiences of music. So this varied from no training at all, to having studied music at school, to having careers at profession, as professional musicians. And the participants, relatively commonly for qualitative research, were interviewed in their homes. The researchers describe their approach to interviewing as a life history approach with open-ended questions focused on obtaining a biographical account of the participants' lives and experiences and they were encouraged to discuss the meaning and function of music in their lives. So they say in this quotation the interviews placed the life experience of the participants as the focus of the conversation and asked them to reflect on the importance of music in their daily lives, the way music functioned in their lives and the perceived benefits of being engaged in music making or listening. And they talked about using a recursive questioning style. So, for example, if a participant mentioned spiritual elements of music and why it was important to them, the interviewer would follow up 
um, with some probing questions around um, the importance of the spiritual dimensions of music. Tell me more about this. What do you mean by spiritual? How is music spiritual? And so on. So this can be seen as a sort of a participant led approach to interviewing, often captured in the term and I'm going to put it in quotation marks because it has some problems, semi-structured interviewing. So the idea that there's some planned aspects of the interview, but also there's scope to be responsive to participants. In this research, there were four rounds of interviews, not that people were each interviewed four times, but the interviews were done in four kind of separate chunks and subsequent interviews. So interviews later on, um, were informed by the data analysis of the first round of the interviews. So data collection centred on the themes that were emerging. I'm putting inverted commas around that because that's somewhat problematic as well. And ideas grounded in the data. So there was a simultaneous process of data collection and data analysis. And there were data analysis informed the subsequent data collection. The authors discussed their conceptual assumptions around um, the subject, the person. They talked about the self as an acting agent capable of using symbols to define their experiences. So here they're understanding participants as having experiences and able to reflect on and communicate them to a researcher. So this is firmly an experiential conceptualization of personhood. They also talked about music as a symbol used to construct self-identity and give meaning to experiences and emotions. So here again, we're firmly in experiential territory. In terms of their data analysis, they talked about thematic discovery and the use of open and axle coding from the Strauss and Corbin version of grounded theory, an approach to qualitative data analysis developed in the 1960s and 1970s in sociology in the US. Um, when you get to the lecture on thematic analysis, you'll see this approach called thematic coding because researchers are using techniques from grounded theory to basically develop and report a set of themes. So grounded theory is about developing theory from data, theory grounded in data, but here these techniques are used for a different purpose. The authors reported their results under six headings, all of which captured how the participants made sense of music in their lives. So the first heading was identity and understanding of self. And this theme captured how music was an important part of the participants' lives. Through music, they came to know themselves, reflect on their personhood, that music was a symbol for defining their, defining their sense of self, their identity that music was a symbolic representation of who they are and how they like to be perceived by others, that retirement allowed participants more time to engage with music, and music was a way of redefining their identities following retirement. Many participants reported that music occupied their daily lives in retirement, so listening to music, working as a volunteer on community radio, and during the interviews, participants also recalled past events and the associated emotions when listening to music. So music was a way for participants to express their inner life. Connection, self and others captured the way music provided a means for people to feel connected to themselves, to others. That this was considered important as people aged and they experienced loss that music was seen as a social glue that provided opportunities to interact with others, a way of communicating with others who lost the ability to communicate through language. So music was a form of communication. Under the theme of well-being, therapy and health, participants talked about music being central to maintaining a sense of well-being and a subjective sense of good health, even for participants who had chronic health conditions and disabilities that music was a source of distraction that enabled feel, people to feel uplifted, that they were never alone when they were listening to music, that music also helped them recover from procedures, and they felt more whole when listening to music. So music was associated with inner happiness and peace. It had a therapeutic value, it was rejuvenating, and playing music helped people to maintain their physical functionality. Under the heading of emotions, arousal and alignment, participants talked about using music to feel more content, more relaxed, more hopeful. And music provided a way of expressing and feeling emotions and relief from daily stress and pressures. 
Under stimulus, fantasy and motivations, music helped maintain optimal ageing, so things like cognitive functioning, and also provided a way of escaping reality and being drawn into fantasy. So music could stimulate participants' imagination and help them learn new material. So music was associated with maintaining a sense of intellectual curiosity. Finally, beauty, aesthetics and spirituality. Aesthetics, always a word, someone with a lisp is going to struggle over. Music provided a sense of beauty that connected them to feelings of spirituality and a feeling of something non-worldly and beyond everyday experience, especially for those who are less mobile. So we can see that these themes are very much focused on participants' experiences, how they're making sense of their reality. So hopefully this gives you a really concrete sense of what experiential research looks like in practice, both the conceptual language that's used, but also what the analysis looks like and what the analysis captures. Here we've given you a brief extract from the paper and particularly the analysis to give you a sense of how the researchers are treating participants' words, how they're treating their language, and how this reflects what Stuart call, called an intentional understanding of language. So, for example, when the extract is introduced, um, the authors say the following statement is typical of the participants' explanations for why they were drawn to music, and the participant um, is quoted as saying, it's just incredible, I find it a totally emotional experience. So here, the, ex the quotation is being presented as capturing the participants' emotional experience of music. So hopefully this gives you a sense of how this paper is based on an intentional theory of language, the idea that language captures speakers' unique perspectives on things, their new, unique reality or truth. If you'd like to have a read of this short extract and reflect on that, do pause the recording now. Now let's consider the other qualitative camp, the critical qualitative research camp. And here, this captures a range of approaches that broadly take an interrogative stance towards the meanings or experiences expressed in the data and uses them to explore some other phenomena. So in critical qualitative research, the focus is not on language as a means to get inside the person's head, but on language as it's used out there in the world how language gives shapes to certain social realities and the impact of these. So typically critical qualitative research is concerned with understanding the factors that influence and the effects and implications of particular meanings or representations expressed in data. It's critical because it doesn't take data at face value. This means that the analyst's interpretations often become more important than the participants. So in an experiential orientation, in the experiential camp, camp, you're concerned with understanding and making sense of how participants view their world. But in the critical camp, your take on the data, your interpretation of the data as a researcher becomes more important, becomes what drives the analysis forward. So let's consider an example of critical qualitative research to try and give a more concrete sense of what this looks like in practice and how this differs from a more experiential orientation. So I've selected a study focused on young women's negotiation of authenticity and body art. And this is partly because there isn't a great tradition of critical qualitative research in applied areas. There is some critical work, but not as much as there is experiential work. In this study, data was collected using focus groups, so group discussions with 15 women who were aged between 15 and 31. And the aim of the study was to access some of the repertoires, so the sort of patterns of sense making that young women use to make sense of body art. And they were defining body art in relation to piercings and tattoos. And the analysis was informed by an approach to discourse analysis developed by the social psychologist Jonathan Potter and Margaret Wetherill. And the authors describe their approach as a feminist social constructionist approach. And they theorised identity as something that we do rather than something that we are. And identity is something that's culturally, historically and politically located. So if you think back to the experiential study and how the authors talked about the participants as 
reflecting on their experiences and able to communicate that. We can see that as typical of an experiential orientation, but here there's a focus on doing, on practice, and this is typical of a more critical orientation. Similar to the experiential study, the analysis here is reported in terms of themes and patterns of meaning and four themes in total. The first theme was being your own person. So body art was seen to represent a particular kind of valued subjectivity, being your own person, autonomous, independent, different, brave and cool. And this very strongly maps on to um, a friend of mine's teenage daughter was telling us about why tattooing is important. And this captured exactly this idea that it's about expressing your individuality and being your own person. And then the second theme was cultural dilution. And this captured changes in the meaning of body, heart, body art. As it become more popular and more mainstream, it no longer represents a meaningful relationship to one's identity. So this idea that um, body art captures being your own person is threatened by this idea of cultural dilution. So in the third and fourth theme, the researchers looked at the accounts that participants drew on to manage the threat from cultural dilution to being your own person. And they found that they used two different um, strategies. Firstly, there was the idea of mobilizing subcultural knowledge. And here, the claim for an authentic identity in relation to body art was gained through the use of exclusive language and information about body art. So the participants positioned themselves as being very well informed, very well immersed in the culture of body art, and that they weren't having tattoos um, willy-nilly without understanding the meaning, the history and the value of this practice. The second strategy, the second account was called othering. And here participants maintained the meaning and value and significance of their own body art by constructing another group to which they did not belong as being the ones without authenticity. So they talked about people being motivated by fashion um, that their engagement in body art was frivolous and their engagement in body art lacked personal meaning. So they constructed a contrast between two groups, people who engage in body art for really meaningful reasons to express their subjectivity and that this group of people are different from others who are doing it for shallow, frivolous and unimportant reasons. So we can see that these themes capture a different way of relating to data, that it's a focus on action, that it has this kind of performative dimension. It's looking at what realities people are bringing into being with language and how they're actively negotiating identity through language. That identity isn't something that sits behind language that gets communicated, that it's through language that the participants are making sense of, negotiating and staking a claim to particular forms of identity. To give you an example of the data analysis, we've got an extract here from one of the participants, Moira, and we'd like to invite you to pause the recording and read through this extract. And then in the next slide, we'll look at an excerpt from the analysis of this extract. So pause the recording now if you'd like to read through this extract. I won't read through the whole extract of the analysis, but I just want to pick out some things that show how it's very different from the experiential approach. So the extract starts by talking about Moira negotiating entitlement and meaning to body art. And this is quite different language from that used in the experiential example. She starts by stating that body art has become fashionable, but in doing so, she's vulnerable to being positioned as someone who part whose participation in body art is motivated by fashion. So we can see that they're kind of talking about the way Moira's language kind of opens up and creates problems for her that she then has to go on to resolve. So we're looking at this active negotiation of identity in the data rather than a more straightforward reporting of how the data reflects participants underlying experience. We've got a real shift here to looking at participants accounts of doing things, of performing particular realities as bringing particular truths into being. So I'd like to invite you to pause the recording now and read through this analysis of the extract and hopefully you'll get a real sense of how this approach to qualitative research is quite different from the experiential approach. 
Here are the references for part two. You might like to read the two example studies that we've discussed in the lecture to get a more detailed sense of what experiential and critical research look like in practice. They're both available on Blackboard. I just want to stress that the main thing we want you to take away from this session is that qualitative research isn't one thing. There are different approaches to qualitative research. I imagine most people listening will be working within the experiential tradition, and that's absolutely fine, but it's just important to understand that there are other ways of doing qualitative research, and understanding a little bit about the other way often helps you to have a better understanding of your way and how you're doing qualitative research. Okay, so we'll leave it there for part two. I hope you come back and join me for part three.